Good. So I'm going to uh, ask lots of questions on your behalf, and hopefully I'll cover lots of the things that you will, but uh, do feel free to shout out uh, also. So a lot of consensus there, as you might expect, in terms of what we're seeing. So uh, an age and fitness adapted strategy and strategy at the moment based on 17 P deletions, P53 mutations, although watch this space in terms of other um, issues. So. Um, the slightly more controversial issue uh, becomes the, the German, you know, um, age 65 on the basis of the CLL uh, 10 trial. You, of course, your group has completely led the world's field in terms of moving away from age to fitness, and now we've kind of almost feels like a little bit of a retrograde uh, step back to be saying that age becomes um, the factor. I understand it's the basis of, of you know, what you saw within the, the trial. But for um, less fit, so once you decide you're using BR, for less fit and more fit patients, are you using the same dosing of BR, or do you also risk adapt your bendamustine dosing on the, the patient also? Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, because uh, I think it's important to really line this out, uh, that this is not the exact dose. So. Uh, the same dose. So uh, for the for the fit ones, we use the uh, 90 milligram per square meter day one, day two. On for the uh, less fit ones, it's always the 70 milligram per square. So this you can even dose reduce. There are some some uh, some uh, elderly patients um, not being fit, so outside of CL10 uh, uh, situation. Uh, when we think about the red box, I showed you the less fit ones. Uh, there are even some patients where you have to dose, dose reduce down to 50 milligrams per square meter. So uh, this, uh, there is some consensus, but uh, it's uh, it's not uh, uh, you know uh, really settled by clinical trials, you know, dose wise. So, and would you do that based on age now, or would you do that based on the age and fitness together in terms of thinking of a of a 90 versus 70 versus 50 milligram right. dosing? Um, I think I would always, always include uh, age um, in this uh, in this perspective. So, a fit one uh, above 65 would receive the 90 milligram, uh, and um, a less fit one above the age of 65 would receive, for example, 70 milligram. So these are these are the things how it's usually done in practice. Even first line. Yes. So um, I hear rumours, although I haven't seen it presented, that you are from CLL10 and from your other studies starting to see the same plateau effect of differences of mutated and unmutated uh, responses with BR that you did with uh, FCR. Is that is that just a rumour, or is that is that true? <laughs> uh, no, the, uh, the, it's 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 true. I mean, uh, there are uh, also the same effects we do see with FCR that. Uh, uh, for sure, the mutated are doing better, and uh, the curves are quite stable, um, uh, and uh, they are not as high um, as FCR, I can tell, but uh, they are quite stable. So yeah. where I'm coming to, and I'll ask you the same question, so in a fit 68-year-old that you know is mutated, are you not tempted to use FCR rather than BR, where you know the results are so good? So is that toxicity worth it for that potential extra benefit and potential cure? Um, I would say 10 years ago, uh, when I was really young, so I, I would say, <laughs> I would say uh, let's go for FCR. But, um, See, I'm getting, I'm getting so close to that age <laughs> okay. where I get put into a category that I don't get what so, you get. So I've got, to, so I've got to try to start pleading to get to considering myself still young. So right. I'm getting but, awfully uh, close to being called old. I mean, um, again, to cite the Greeks, I think the Karis principle... See how the Germans are obsessed <laughs> with Greece at the moment. And that's can not, you blame that's them? That's not my... I think uh, we, we have some news this evening from Greece. Uh, so uh, the, the Karis principle, uh, I think, is not, is not true for, uh, for CLL anymore. I think you don't have to hit in the first run. Very aggressive. So it might be enough to use a BR... Um, and because you have so many choices uh, thereafter. And uh, I mean, we're still talking about elderly patients with CLL. So um, 
I mean, the life expectancy of, uh, of a 65-year-old of maybe 15, 20 years, I think you can cover this with a sequence of therapies nowadays. Sure. And your approach to older fit patients has been slightly different than the German one in terms of uh, maybe not always so bendamustine, but looking for other types of combinations also on the basis of your clinical trials? Yeah, because our, our clinical trial, I remind, was based on uh, uh, patients. It was fit old patients, mm. fit, old, patients over 65, but with That's a CS be, below 6. And it's more or less the same uh, uh, kind of fitness of the CLL10 uh, above uh, 65. But in this population, an, only four courses of FCR appear to be quite feasible. Sure. Now, of course, we will get more data as Mabel matures and we see the outcome of BR. But mm -hmm. for me, a big issue has become you know, there's FCR over here, there's colambucil, abinutuzumab there, and then there's BR in the middle, and it's where does that kind of spectrum fit? And uh, on the one hand, of course, people are see, looking at the CLL11 data and saying, oh, colambucil, abinutuzumab does this, but from CLL10 does that. But of course, CLL10 has the young fit patients, and it's not really the right curve to compare it to, is it? Absolutely. I mean, there is still a missing link or mm. gap. Um, and uh, although I like uh, Mabel, because at least we get uh, an answer about the chemo backbone, uh, chloramicil versus Bender plus rituximab, it's still um, a little bit, I wouldn't say out of, out of days, but you know, it's nowadays I would like to see a comparison with a modern anti-CD20. So, um, but probably no, no one will do this trial anymore. Yeah. Well, at least I think that the, the results of the Mabel trial will be uh, presented at the IWCLL, and it's more than a gut feeling that the results are going to be what's been presented here. Um, uh, there is some practical point of view for the patients over 65. Uh, BR is less toxic, but you have to come twice. And the FCR, it's, it, may, it may be more toxic uh, than a BR, but you have to come once. And for patients, it can be a difference. But I think that uh, um, we have these two choices in the same kind of population. But I would, um, for the elderly patient, clearly have four types of patients patients where chlorambucil is given as a palliative uh, care to relieve some symptoms, and patients who are uh, over 65 and clearly unfit who will be given a combination of chlorambucil with GA101, rituximab, or ofatumumab, and our decision is not totally made. And there is a third population who are uh, over 55 and less unfit and they will be treated with BR, especially the patients with impaired kidney function. And then we have uh, very fit patients over 65 who will still be treated with uh, uh, four courses of FCR. It's probably what will happen in France uh, unless we have uh, another study to do. <laughs> now, the issue of, uh, uh, you both showed the data on the brutinib and how the upfront patients are doing very well, but in the relapse setting, and particularly in the 17P setting, the curves are continuing to drop down, and the question then becomes, these drugs are so much better than what we had before, but what do we do when a patient fails uh, ibrutinib? So what's your approach to manage uh, those patients? I mean, the, the wise answer would be to include in a clinical trial, but uh, yeah. this uh, doesn't help all the time, because, uh, I mean, ABT trials are very attractive for these kind of patients. Uh, the first trials excluded these kind of patients. Now there is a trial where you can put the patients in. I think a BCL2 inhibitor would be a wise choice. Um, but outside of a clinical trial, what would I do? I would switch uh, from a BTK inhibitor to a PR3 kinase inhibitor, and the other way uh, also from a PR3 to a BTK inhibitor. So. Um, even knowing that uh, you know these specific side effects uh, might be quite dangerous. For example, I have a patient. You know, I, I had a myocardial infarction, uh, progressing on on um, on, a, on a PR3 kinase inhibitor. Now I have to switch on BTK, knowing that with Plavix, that's not a very uh, non-risky idea. So, uh, but this would be my choice. So. 
you know, for lots of pa for lots of our patients, the idea of ke chemo-free regimens is a very attractive one. And but now, what we're seeing more and more, as you introduced the topic of uh, the the addition of uh, of novel drugs plus chemo, and it's quite often a, a bendamustine chemo backbone. Um, what do you think? Where do you see the future going in terms of? Uh, is, is is chemo had its day, or, or does it? Are we throwing out the baby with the bathwater? And the right combination is going to be chemo novel agent combinations. What, what what do you think? I think that we developed uh, for for relapse or for frontline. In, in, for, in, in in general terms, are we I, I, is hmm. is a chemo free uh, well, is a Californian approach uh, well, uh, on the horizon? Well, uh, so hmm, you showed I, route one. So not, let's stick yeah, with California. Might, yeah, we will try. You, we would like to be like in California, in France, but I think that we <laughs> won't be like that for a long for a long time. And I think that uh, we are looking very Californian tonight. Oh, thank you. <laughs> 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 Thank you, uh, John. I think that um, for um, we developed uh, uh, everywhere some uh, very sophisticated uh, bi molecular biology cores to uh, test, uh, for example, mutata muta mutated status, IGH mutation. And uh, frankly, uh, we know that there is a strong prognostic impact of this status. And I have not seen any guideline based on this mutational status. And on a kind of uh, um, pharmacoeconomic point of view, uh, I think that uh, it would be uh, advisable to test patients to check whether or not they have a mutated CLL. And in case of mutated CLL, it would be maybe the IPI uh, number two, or you know, in CLL IPI with mutated CLL, you give immunochemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And if at three courses the MRD is still positive, then you into trouble, and then you have to move to another kind of chemo. So we have uh, these, um, we have this technology to predict a good response to immunochemotherapy and before immunochemotherapy and even after three courses. So we should use this. And at least for 40% of the population, we can use an option, which is a short time option to be given, six months, and then for 10 years, no chemo, nothing. So I think this is uh, probably um, a choice we, we should propose. We should propose. Conversely, there will be the new agent, and maybe the new agent will do better. But I'd like to be sure that the new agent will, be do, will do better for the patient in terms of activity and tolerance than uh, FCR, for example, in mutated patients achieving negative MRD. Sure. And for you, I guess if with Greece's exit, you'll be able to afford everything you want in Germany now. But the, um, uh, where do, you've kind of in your triple T kind of approaches, uh, clearly looking to incorporate a mixture of chemotherapy and non-chemotherapy regimens. So two issues there. So is that the way that your study group sees the future in terms of using those optimally? And just a little uh, clarification for me is what you do in that setting for the patients with 17P deletions, are you, looking for a different approach for them. Okay. Yeah. So to the first question, just to make it very easy, I would say the new trials of the German Cell Study Group uh, include um, a little chemo in the beginning for debarking because we think a little chemo in the beginning is better than chemicals lifelong. So meaning that um, if you have to take a protein or idella lifelong because you don't get a full remission, uh, that's uh, uh, inferior value than having a little chemo in the beginning and getting a CR, maybe even MRD negative. So we do not know, but this will be the approach. So chemo is clearly included. Um, also, less is more also, less cycles, but it's included. In the answer to your question, uh, to your second question, uh, a specific approach to, let's call it ultra high risk, uh, 17P, TP53, um, that's um, a kind of a, what's, I would call it a, a triple approach 
with uh, two of these uh, drugs. So uh, we combine a specific uh, trial called GIF, the BTK inhibitor ibrutinib plus um, um, ABT199 plus um, an anti-CD20, so. Oh, you do need Greece to lead the idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, we, we would like to do it together with Greece. <laughs> okay, sure, okay. Um, I've uh, very selfishly taken up all the question time here. We're gonna now close the CLL component. We're gonna move on to follicular lymphoma.